He is risen. Now, if we were together, if you were uh, sitting in the sanctuary here as I'm giving this message, you would be shouting in response, He is risen indeed. And I don't want you to think that just because you're at home watching this or reading this, that you get off the hook for uh, responding enthusiastically and loudly uh, to that call and response. So I'm going to do it one more time, and I expect your neighbors to be able to hear you say, He is risen indeed. He is risen. Thank you so much for doing that with me. It helps me feel a little bit more like this is Easter. It feels so strange uh, to not be together. And I do want to, at the beginning, thank you for joining us on this Easter Sunday. Uh, I miss you all dearly. Normally on an Easter Sunday here at First Baptist, we'd have 800 plus people at our three services. And I desperately want to be with each and every one of you. I miss you greatly. I wish I could look you in the eye, give you a handshake, give you a hug. Uh, But in this season, we can't do that. And yet there is a silver lining to all of this. Uh, God is at work. God is doing great things here at First Baptist Church, in this community, and around the world. And this Easter, we get to celebrate that and worship that. And just think, even though we're not able to be together Though there would be 800 plus of us who'd be greeting one another, worshiping Jesus together, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through these means and through churches like ours all over the world, there might be two, three, four times as many people who hear an Easter Sunday message. We might have thousands who ultimately join us in worship this Easter as a result of us not being able to be together. God has scattered his church And through his scattered church, he is reaching so many people with the good news of Easter and of Jesus Christ. And so we're celebrating that this morning. Uh, By a show of hands, how many of you still put on your Easter Sunday best for this service? Okay, and how many of you decided to wear your pajamas for the first time ever to an Easter Sunday service because you could? I I thought there would be some of you who would roll out of bed and take advantage of the opportunity to wear whatever you went to bed in to worship the Lord Jesus, but we're just excited. Wherever you are right now, however you are right now, we're excited that you're here to worship Jesus Christ, the risen Lord with us. Will you join me in prayer? Jesus, you are alive. You are risen, risen indeed. And we are here to worship you, to glorify you, to make your name great. We are here to learn all that you want us to learn as your disciples, as your children, as your loved ones about who you are and what you have done, about what you are doing in this day, about what it means to live for you and give ourselves completely to you. And we pray that you'd be glorified in us as we do that. We give this time to you. We give the study of your word to you. We invite, once again, your Holy Spirit to teach us and transform us. We want to become more like you, Jesus. And we know that's only possible if the Spirit is at work in a powerful way. So we give ourselves to you and we worship you, the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, the risen Messiah, and Savior, the God who lives, and because you live, we live also. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. So we've been studying through John's gospel since we started uh, this fall, and all through John's gospel, he's been giving his readers an opportunity to hear over and over and over again these amazing claims, these radical claims by Jesus about himself, about who he is, about his relationship with the Father, about the mission that he had been sent on in this world. And now we reach the climax of this story. And throughout this, John, again, has been sharing the claims of Jesus, but then giving examples from his life, from his teachings, from his miracles, helping the reader discern and decide for themselves whether Jesus' claims about himself are true or not. And so when we come to the climax here, there's so much truth and power in what happens in John chapter 20 that it's going to take us a little while to unpack all of this. Uh, i got to warn you, I'm a little pumped up because this is an Easter Sunday message, and so I invite you to buckle up and get ready for the ride that God is going to take us on. Uh, But we're going to come and we're going to read John chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John 20 now. I'll be reading the entirety of this chapter. And here at First Baptist, if you're watching one of our sermons for the very first time, we invite people to stand as the main text for the message that morning is read out of a sign of reverence and awe and wonder, a sign of respect, a sign of gratitude that God has spoken to us in his word and and a readiness to respond to the word of God in our words, our thoughts, our attitudes, and actions. So if you're able, it's a long chapter. If you're able to stand while I read, I invite you to do that now. If not, that's okay. You can remain seated as I read John chapter 20. 
Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. And we've learned throughout the study of John that John is actually referring to himself there when he says the other disciple or the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciple went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had said these things, that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So in this passage, we find irrefutable, irrefutable evidence of at least five life-changing realities, five world-changing realities, five time history of the world-changing realities. And that's what we're going to be examining in more depth and detail right now. So the first, the evidence for the first life-changing reality is the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mary, who is mentioned here in John's account, and other women who are mentioned in other gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, arrive very early Sunday morning and find an empty tomb. They are first-hand witnesses. They are the first people on the scene to recognizing that God has done something miraculous. Now, they don't know at first that that is what happened. They assume the worst, that someone has taken Jesus' body, and yet they're the first ones to see with their own eyes what God has done at Easter by raising Jesus from the dead. Peter and John are also alerted to this, and they run to the tomb. They not only see the empty tomb, but they enter the empty tomb. They find that there is no body there. In fact, they not only see that there's no body, but they also find the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in lying neatly in the tomb. Now, if someone had stolen the body of Jesus, surely these grave clothes would have either been missing or they would have been strewn about the tomb. It doesn't make any sense that someone would unwrap the body very carefully, very perfectly, keeping the linens intact, 
carry the body out of the tomb, and then take the time to put the linens exactly where the body had been. And yet that's what Peter and John saw. Jesus then appears to Mary. He appears to the rest of the disciples on that day. He appears to Thomas a week later. He appears to all of them so that they all serve as firsthand witnesses that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the grave. Now, some of you watching this morning likely don't believe that Jesus rose from the grave. But I'm confident that if you do two things, if you're willing to do two things, that you too will come to believe that Jesus is the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is the Son of God, that everything he claimed about himself is true, including the resurrection. The two things that I'm asking you to do is this. First, you must be genuinely open in your mind and in your heart to the reality that maybe Jesus is the Son of God that maybe Jesus did rise again from the grave. The reality is, we all like to be right. My wife and my sons would tell you that I sure like to be right. And as a result of our desire to be right and to be shown to be right over and over again, we have something, we all have something called confirmation bias. And that's where we look for evidence, we look for facts, we look for things that already support or bolster the things that we currently believe. And anything, any news, any information, any facts that might counteract what we already believe, we quickly push aside, we quickly dismiss, we quickly say, I'm not going to pay any attention to that. So if, if you'd be open in your heart and mind to consider the reality, if you'd be open to considering the fact that Jesus did rise again from the grave, and number two, if you're willing to do an honest examination and evaluation of the evidence, both in Scripture and in other ancient historical texts, if you're willing to have an open heart and mind and be willing to do an honest and thorough examination and evaluation of the evidence, I believe with all my heart that you will come to believe that Jesus did rise from the dead, that his resurrection is an historical fact, and that because of that, that changes everything about who Jesus is and about what it means to live our lives for him. I believe, number two, there is evidence in this text of the immeasurable power of God. Now, according to the latest scientific research, in the known universe, there is someone somewhere between one billion trillion stars, which is a one with 21 zeros behind it, or one tri- somewhere between that and one trillion trillion stars, which is a one with 24 zeros behind it. This is the number right here of 1 trillion trillion. So scientists believe that somewhere between 1 billion trillion and 1 trillion trillion stars exist in the known universe. Now the reality is, for you and I, this this number is way too large for us to even fathom. So let's try to put it in a context that we might understand a little bit better. If, If 1 trillion trillion were seconds, that many seconds would equal 31 quadrillion, 709 trillion, 791 billion, 983 million, 760,000 years. So over 31 quadrillion years is a trillion trillion seconds. Now the only thing that we can probably think of that gets close to that is our national debt. Okay, I'm just kidding. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we, we can't fathom numbers this large and yet That's how many stars are in the known universe. And listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. We worship a God who breathed out a trillion, trillion stars. By his very breath, they were made. That's how powerful, how awesome how amazing our God is. And yet, him creating a trillion, trillion stars by his breath pales in comparison to his power on display through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The most awesome demonstration of the immeasurable power of God is Jesus being raised from the dead. Think about it. Almighty God died. That is a sobering and unthinkable truth that Jesus, fully God, in the flesh, fully man and fully God, that he died. Can you think of Almighty God dying? That that in and of itself doesn't make any sense. And yet, God himself died, and then God rose himself from the grave. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, brought Jesus back to life. That is unbelievable, immeasurable power. 
without a doubt, the greatest power that the world, that the cosmos, that all of history has ever witnessed. We not only see that Jesus' resurrection and all the evidence for that, we see this evidence for the immeasurable power of God. We also see evidence, number three, of the mission of Jesus in this text. Now, as bad as COVID-19 is, and this is really bad, right? This is a really challenging, trying time here in our community and to every corner of the planet. There are millions of people who have now been infected around the world, hundreds of thousands who have died. And Jesus came on a mission to defeat a far more deadly disease disease that grips the life of every man and woman, every student and child. That disease is sin. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Many people, millions of people are being infected with this virus, and yet every person throughout all of history on the face of the earth has been infected with the disease of sin. And while COVID-19 has a mortality rate somewhere between 1% and 10% for those who get this virus, and that depends on the country, apart from Jesus Christ, apart from the cure, sin has a 100% mortality rate. Everyone who sins will die. Romans 6.23a says this, for the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus came on a mission. He came on a mission to save us to save the entire world from this deadly disease of sin with its consequence of death. He came to break the power of sin and death. He came to give us real, true, everlasting life. Jesus came to bring peace between God and humankind. He says multiple times throughout this text, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Jesus desires to bring peace between you and God himself. A holy, awesome, perfect, almighty God, and you who apart from Jesus are dead in your trespasses and sins, completely lost, completely hopeless. And he comes to bridge that gap. His mission is to make a way for you to be reunited with your father who loves you so much and made you to live in a perfect love relationship with him, to be reunited with the son, to be reunited with the Holy Spirit. That is the mission of Jesus. And he is able to offer peace between God and every person because he went to the cross. And when he went to the cross, he bore our sin and our shame. And when he died, it died with him. Your sin is dead and gone. It was born by Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus gave his life, when he breathed his laugh, as he shed his blood, your sin died with him. And when he rose again, he conquered sin and death. He destroyed those enemies for those who placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And now he's at work throughout the world, both through his spirit and through his church, to bring this message of hope and forgiveness and love and peace and life to all. He desires that none would perish, that all would come into a life-saving relationship, a life-giving relationship with him. Jesus accomplished the mission that he was sent to accomplish in his years here on earth. And now it is up to us, his church, by the leading and power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God to continue his mission of glorifying our heavenly father and of bringing the good news of Jesus Christ, of his love, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness and salvation to all who are dying without him. It is up to us to continue that mission that he started. A fourth thing that we see evidence of, strong evidence in this text, is evidence of the heart of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were Jesus, almighty and perfect God in the flesh, fully God, fully human, and I had spent three years pouring my life, my heart, my soul into my disciples, teaching them, training them, loving them, correcting them, particularly those 12 disciples I think of, and one of them decided to betray me, And another one of them decided to deny me in my hour of greatest need. And the other ten, save maybe for John, decided to abandon me in that hour of excruciating pain and suffering. When I came back on the scene, when I rose from the grave, I might have some stern words for my disciples as a result of their abandonment of me. And what we see in this passage is the exact opposite of that. Jesus reveals himself in personal and intimate 
and gentle ways to Mary and to the disciples. You see, he met each disciple exactly where they were at, in the midst of their confusion, in the midst of their sadness, in the midst of their doubts, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their fear. Jesus met every single one of them where they were at that first Easter day. For Mary, he responded compassionately to her desperate plea for help, and he lovingly called her by name, Mary. I I, I love to picture that scene as Mary is so distraught. Imagine her Savior, her Messiah, has died. I mean, that is unthinkable. That is unbearable. That is so painful. And now his body is missing. I mean, the flood of emotions, of grief, of turmoil, of sadness that must have been rushing through her heart and mind. And Jesus looks at her and he calls her by name, Mary. And they have a beautiful, tender, passionate moment between a Savior and his daughter. He enabled Peter and John to see the empty tomb and grave grave clothes for themselves so that they might believe that he was alive. For the rest of the disciples, he appears suddenly in the upper room. He greets them with, peace be with you. And he allowed them to see his hands and his side. He told them that he was going to send them just as his father had sent him. And he, he gives them a taste. He gives them an experience. He breathes on them the Holy Spirit in some unique supernatural way. We see that they receive the fullness of the Spirit at Pentecost, but they receive some taste, some, some experience of the Spirit here because he wants them to know that though he is ascending to the Father, that he will be with them always through the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And then for doubting Thomas. You know, we use that name for him and we tend to hear and say that title of his with a negative connotation. Why do we do that? We all doubt at times. I, I have doubted at times in the midst of this worldwide pandemic and all that it could mean for Mandy and for our boys, for me, for our family. I, I have struggled with fears and doubt at times. We all do that. And so if, if anything, let's say doubting Thomas with an understanding that we're a lot like him. And the good news is that Jesus compassionately meets Thomas in the midst of his doubt. He allows Thomas to literally feel the holes in his hands and in his side so that Thomas might know and believe that he is the risen Lord. There's no denying that the heart of Jesus is one of perfect and unending love, not only for his disciples, but for all people in all times and all places. Jesus knit every single human being together in their mother's womb, and he has been pursuing them with his love every moment of their lives. He loves everyone and desires for everyone to come into a life-giving, life-saving relationship with him. He desires to meet each one where they are at, reveal himself to them as Lord and Savior, as Messiah, as lover, as friend, and give them real eternal life. Fifth and finally, this text has chock full of evidence that calls for response from you and from me. John closes this chapter with these words in verses 31 or 30 and 31. I'm going to read those again. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you, hearer, that you, reader, might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. If you have not yet believed in Jesus... If you have not yet repented of your sin and asked him to forgive you, to cleanse you, to redeem your life, if you have not yet received his gift of mercy and grace and forgiveness and love, do that today. May today be the day of salvation in your life. May you turn to Jesus, cry out to him, receive his love and mercy and grace. Turn from your way of living or the world's way of living and embrace the only way to live, the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is the only way to live. It is the best life and it's the only way to truly live. Embrace him, receive him, become a follower of his today. In the book of Revelation, another of the Apostles John's writings, he records these words of Jesus in chapter 3, verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in 
and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart right now. By his Holy Spirit and by the word of God that you have heard proclaimed to you, Jesus is right there at the door of your heart right now. He's knocking. He loves you more than you can even fathom. He died. He gave his life. He shed his blood on the cross so that you could be forgiven and redeemed, so that you could be caught up in the eternal perfect love relationship between Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and God's people. He desires to live with you, to live in you, and to live through you. He will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. I implore you, I beg you now, to turn to Jesus, to cry out to him and receive all that he has to offer you, to receive him into your very life. If you'd like to know more about repenting of your sin, believing in Jesus and living as a disciple of his, living as his beloved child, we would love to help you as a church. You can visit our website, firstbaptistchurchcambridge.org, or firstbaptistcambridge.org. Look it up, and you can speak with one of the pastors if you call our church office. You can explore the many ways online that we are seeking to minister in this time of COVID-19 through our Facebook page, through YouTube, through our church website. If you live in the area, we would love to personally connect with you in some way. We would love to encourage you to hear this decision that you made to pray with you and to help you begin this new, amazing relationship with Jesus Christ that you have. If you're not from our area, please, please find a local church family that believes in Jesus Christ, that professes his name and proclaims his gospel, that believes in the word of God and seeks to live by the teachings in God's word. Find a church like that so that you can get plugged in, build relationships, and grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you are already a follower of Jesus Christ, this text demands a response from you and me as well. This text calls you and me to a life of total devotion to Jesus Christ. You know, so many of us go through the motions in our relationship with Christ. No more! No more! May we never go through the motions another day of our life because we are caught up in this interactive, intimate love relationship with our Lord and Savior, and we can't wait to spend the next moment with him, and then the next moment, and then the next moment. He is the risen Lord. He is the risen King of Kings. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, and he is worthy of your everything. He is worthy of my everything. Learn to trust more fully in him, and to rest more deeply in his perfect love for you every day. Spend time daily with Jesus in his word and in prayer. Spend time daily in service of God and others. Spend the ordinary mundane moments of life, whether those be the ordinary mundane moments of COVID-19 life or the ordinary mundane moments when we finally all are free to move about and do our, uh, our usual stuff. In those moments, spend them with Jesus. He wants to be with you everywhere all the time. And by his spirit, he lives in you. Acknowledge his presence and invite him to do anything and everything with you that you are doing and seek to live moment by moment with him and for him. You also have a mission. Another way that we respond to this glorious truth, to Jesus being the risen Lord, is to accept, to receive, and to live out this mission that he has put us on. Our mission is to continue his mission, of glorifying our Heavenly Father through our words, our thoughts, our attitudes and actions, and sharing the good news of Jesus in word and in deed, every opportunity that we get to glorify God, to obey Him, to worship Him in all ways, in the ways that we use our our time, our energy, our resources, the ways we engage in relationships. Let's glorify God and live in such a way and speak in such a way that others could hear and see the good news that Jesus has come to save them as well. As I said at the beginning of this message, I'm so blessed that you joined us for Easter 2020. The world and every one of our lives is very different now than anyone of us would have expected going back two or three months ago. And yet, the fact remains that Jesus is alive, that Jesus 
is the Savior, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King. He rules and reigns over all. And he comes to you, and he comes to me, with arms open wide, wanting to embrace us and love us and carry us through everything that life throws our way. May our faith in him grow continually. May our love for God and for others in thought, word, and deed, may that love ever increase. And may our witness to the reality that Jesus is the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, may our witness to that go forth with joy and with power. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I'm overwhelmed by the gift that you gave us when you sent your one and only Son. You sent him on a mission to seek and to save the lost. You sent him knowing full well that at the end of his life, he would hang on the cross. His body would be beaten, his blood would be shed, and he would die. He would experience separation from you for the first time in all of eternity. And yet you sent him. You loved us enough to send your one and only son to die in our place so that we could be reunited with you, so that we could be caught up in the love relationship that you have been pursuing with us with all of our days of our lives. And Jesus, we thank you that you came, that you lived a perfect life, that you showed us and taught us how to live. And then you did give your life on the cross. You, you bore our sin and our shame. Perfect, holy God, dying in our place. Sinners, enemies of yours, and yet you gave your life so that we could have a love relationship with you, so that we could be forgiven of our sins and begin to walk with you, discovering real, true life, a life of intimacy with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what eternal life is. You said that yourself, Jesus, that eternal life is knowing God and knowing you. Help us to receive and embrace this gift that you've given to us. Jesus, if there is anyone listening to this message who has not placed their faith in you, may today be the day of salvation. May the, today be the day that they respond to your love, that they respond to your life, that they respond to your teachings, that they respond to the reality of who you are, Jesus. May they turn from their sin and embrace you and receive life, abundant life everlasting. And Holy Spirit, we are amazed that you would choose to come and live in us. We are broken vessels, and yet you fill us. And because you fill us, we are glorified in the presence of our Father. We receive the righteousness of Jesus. We're clothed in his righteousness because of what Jesus has done, and because our Father and his Son have sent you, Holy Spirit. We want to live for Jesus, and we need your help, Holy Spirit, to do that. We cannot do that on our own. We are desperately dependent on you. And yet so often we live independent from you. So break us of that. Help us to live daily in dependence on you and surrender to you. Help us to live daily in obedience to our Father, to Jesus, and to you, Holy Spirit, and to this beautiful word that you've given us. We thank you, Jesus, that you came to seek and to save the lost. We thank you that you came because you love the world and every person in this world. And you desire that everyone would come to faith and come to salvation through you. We commit ourselves to you this day. Whether we are brand new believers or have been walking with you our entire life, we commit ourselves to you this day and we thank you that you have given yourself completely to us and on our behalf. We worship you this Easter. You have risen. You have risen indeed. And we love you. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Again, if you're someone who does not have a church family, or maybe today was the first day that you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, we would love to connect with you, to encourage you, to pray with you, and to help you begin that relationship with him. 
And if you're a believer, I hope that you've been blessed and encouraged looking at the power of the scripture and the evidence that is there that we can have confidence in our God as we walk with him through these days of trial and challenge and through everything that life will bring our way until we see him face to face, either because he calls us home to be with him or he comes back to get us. I love you all, and I'm praying for you and asking Jesus to do the miraculous in your life. Have a blessed day.